Hello, everybody. Um, greetings out there in Zoom land. This is my first time on Zoom, maybe yours too. Hopefully it's working good on both ends. Today we're gonna to talk about underutilized plants in the urban landscape. Lots of different plants to choose from, but just so many that aren't being used or using very much of. So I wanna just cover some plants. Some will be new, some will be old. Mostly we're gonna discuss trees, but we are gonna look at some shrubs. Some of the trees will be suitable for street tree plantings. Others will not. Uh, that's okay because not all you do just street tree plantings. Some of you do restoration uh, plantings, uh, parks plantings, commercial and residential landscape plantings. So hopefully this will have something for everybody. So if you have your hot cup of coffee pour and a comfy chair, we're gonna get started. It's showtime. Okay, sometimes I think we have too many plants to choose from. People are always confused as to what they get. And there's always the old joke about the city person that calls up every year and says, you know, I want 50 ivory silk lilacs and 50 green spider lindens and 50 skyline locusts. And that's always a joke in the nursery trade. Sorry, you people out there, but the, the things are changing. People are using different plants and that's good. But we have a lot of stuff here in zone five, zone four that we can use. So maybe we're just too set in our ways. We all have our own comfort zone and we just need to try something different. There's been a lot of talk about diversity on a lot of these lectures, and I think that's wonderful. Um, hopefully from Dutch elm disease and Emerald Ashbor, we've learned our lesson on diversity. But the one thing that people always stress is we want diversity between genus and between species, and that's great. But I think on a micro level, nobody ever talks about diversity between cultivars. Well, we just gotta stop planting skyline locusts when we have other locusts. Not all Jap tree lilacs are every silk, so we need to also diversify a little bit with between the cultivars too. Okay, I'm not getting next. Let's see here. Okay, there we go. So first one we're gonna talk about is a columnar tree, sugar maple Apollo. All the rage right now is columnar trees. What do you got for narrow space? We do grow Apollo sugar maple. It doesn't get very big. Um, 15 feet, 18 feet wide at most by about 35, 40 feet. It's slower growing. You would use it the same as you would a uh, columnar Norway maple, which we don't want to plant anymore. But it's just one we don't get a lot of people buying. I've got a few municipalities trying it. People who buy it like it. And again, it's a little slower growing and you got to have the right site for a sugar maple. But it's a good one to consider when you're looking for something that's narrow. Here's Apollo sugars in our nursery. You can see at this stage an inch and a half, inch and three quarter how columnar they are. Uh, this is Apollo in an arboretum. You can see by the trunk, it's not a real young tree, but you can see it still holds that small form. That's the uh, end of the maple on the sugar maple. Next one I've got is tree flowered maple, Acer triflorum. This is an interesting maple because most people aren't familiar with it. The leaf isn't the typical maple leaf people think of when they think of Norway and sugar maple. Interesting thing is this plant is already well in the zone four. They are growing it very successfully, even in Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. It's a small ornamental tree. And again, it's gonna get that 25, 30 foot range. So if you're looking for something small, this is a good one to consider. It's got a lot of interest. It's got interesting leaf, interesting bark, and interesting fall color. 
The real strange thing on this tree is no two are alike. If somebody wants two matching trees, it's impossible. They all are uniquely shaped. Here's a shot of the peeling ornamental bark. And this is fall color. And I see there's a typo there because it's not October 2020 yet. That was from October 2019. But this tree can often get a good red color. Sometimes it's orange. And I've seen it if it's in part shade, have scarlet, orange, and yellow all on the same plant. So it's a neat little tree if you're looking for something for a small area. There's a lot of buckeyes on the market. And this is ours, of course, early glow buckeye, Aeschylus Glaber JN Select. JN Select is Johnson's Nursery Select. So it's our introduction. Some of you who have used this probably realize we've had this a number of years, but only in very small, limited numbers. In fact, some people used to say you advertise it, but you never have it. How do I get it? And I would tell people, you got to call six, eight months ahead or you don't get it. Part of the reason was we propagated it in our own nursery with our small propagation department. We grow 40 a year and you had to get on the list quicker. You wouldn't get them. We have now licensed a grower on the West Coast to produce the liner for us. And then we get the Barrett liner back and we put it in the B&B field or in a container. And right now I've got tons of them. Initially, this tree had two other names. So if you think back, for those who have ordered this for a long time, it originally came out as Menominee Scarlet. Uh, sadly, we found people out of state could not pronounce Menominee. So when they'd call in on the phone to order, uh, we heard Menominee pronounced every way you can imagine. And we changed the name to Sunset Buckeye. And after a few years, we decided to trademark it and we found Sunset was already taken. We couldn't use that name and it became Early Glow, which is a very apt name. It's got a beautiful red fall color and it colors extremely early. The tree typically will start coloring up late August and by mid-September, it's totally dormant. Interesting history behind this tree is it was selected out of a a Ohio Buckeye that was growing in a backyard in Wauwatosa, Wisconsin. Our propagator at the time, Michael Yanni, would drive by this tree going to work every day for years. And every fall, he said he would admire the beautiful fall color on it, but he always wanted to stop and get some nuts to propagate it, and he just never had the time. So one year, he finally did get there, and he knocked on the door, and he asked the homeowner, can I pick the nuts? I'm from Johnson's Nursery. I want to propagate it. And the guy says, well, buddy, I've been here 30 years. We've never had a nut on the tree yet, which really made it interesting. So Mr. Yanni did look on the, for nuts and found none. So he ended up chip butting the tree to propagate it. And what we found is the flower is imperfect. When it's on its own, it will not self-pollinate. So if you plant it by its own, you get no nuts. If you have it near other buckeye species and it cross-pollinates, it will produce just a handful of nuts. That's an interesting concept for municipal use because if you're putting them on a street tree planting, you don't want all those nuts raining down on the parked cars. Here's a shot of that same buckeye or a different buckeye, same kind in bloom, typical buckeye flower in late May. And again, the flowers have fewer no nuts, they're imperfect. Interesting aspect also is there's very high resistance to leaf blotch, leaf scorch. Quite a number of buckeyes on the market today are not very resistant to blotch and scorch. Uh, we know because we grow a bunch of them and some of them are great till July, August and the leaves get fungal issue and don't look so good. This one actually, out of all the ones we grow, the two best we grow against leaf blotch and scorch are early glow and homestead. So another good attribute for municipal plantings. Here's a shot showing again that color very early in the fall, which can be advantageous or disadvantageous depending if you want it to color late in the year. But as a Really good color almost every year. Our 
there are other buckeyes we're working on and growing. And this next one is a kind of a sneak preview. We're not selling it yet. We will have it out in one to two years. Uh, we've named it Mystic Ruby Buckeye. And everybody calls and they want that red buckeye. And for years, people ask me for Aeschylus pavia, which is an hardy in Wisconsin. Uh, luckily, no one asks for that anymore. Uh, 25, 30 years ago, we had Briody horse chestnut, which has a beautiful red flower, but it suffers terrible tip dieback in our winter climate. Uh, luckily, you don't ask me for that anymore. And we also had Fort McNair, which is very beautiful, but extremely susceptible to blotch and scorch in summer. So the leaves turn brown by August. This one is our introduction. It's got a beautiful red flower, super cold hardy, and much better blotch scorch resistance than most of the, well, any of the other red flowering buckeyes we've tested it against. We started growing this tree before we even named it. We had a super cold winter, and our Fort McNairs are all tip damaged from the cold. We couldn't even dig orders that spring for them. Two rows afterwards in the same field, we had Mystic Ruby blooming. I actually took this shot at that spring and they were no winter damage, blooming away beautifully. And since then we've tested it in Twin Cities, Minnesota and it's done well. And it's now on test in Fargo, North Dakota. Here's a close up of the flower and bloom. And this is a little bit faded, but this is a larger tree all in bloom just to show you what it's gonna look like. So we will have these for sale in one to two years. So keep an eye out for it, something new. And looks like there's gonna be a big market for it due to the hardiness. So it appears to be the hardiest red buckeye we know of. I wanted to talk a little bit about alders. For years, we had European black alder, and it's now banned in the state of Wisconsin. We cannot leg legally sell it. We haven't had it for eight years. But I don't know if everyone knows that because there's a certain municipality out there, and I get their lists every spring to bid on, and they always list European black alder. And I get calls from people, where can I find them? Please, you cannot buy it in the state of Wisconsin. <laughs> you might be able to buy it in other states, but don't ship it in. It is banned in our state due to the invasive nature. If you really need something to take the place of black alder, we have been growing our native speckled alder, almost in Canada for a number of years now. I find it native on all the trout streams I fish in the state. It'll grow standing in water, it'll grow in moist sites, just like black alder. It'll also grow in dry sites because this shot shown here was from our field and it's a regular dry site. But if you need an alder because you have a wet site, you want to screen something off, I would suggest going to speckled alder. And speckled alder has catkins just like all the alders are related to birch. We normally grow speckled in shrub form or clump, but once in a while we get a single stem, but usually in nature it's found as a clump form. And this is a shot showing it bald and burlapped as a clump form, which is what we typically grow them as. But again, excellent for wet sites if you need something for wet. It's a close up of all their leaves unspeckled. We've also been experimenting with spathe alder. Now spathe alder I think has a lot of potential as a street tree. It's used a lot in Europe. It gets quite large, 60, 80 feet. It's a cross of a European alder and an Asian alder. Super good at being single stem. I don't see it suckering. It does very well fast growth, just like all the alders. But the thing that I like about it, that if you look at this photo, I took this one year in September, very, very clean leaf, even late in the season. Now we only have one 
source for a line around Spaith Alder and the West Coast. And although we've, I think we've had three crops now, we're trying to increase numbers and we cannot get more liners from this grower. Apparently everybody else is trying to get the liners too. So we always sell out of this tree early and as soon as we can increase numbers, we will. If you're interested in a spathe alder for planting, that's one that sells out real quick. Again, there's a close up of the leaf, which is why I think it's a really interesting alder. We do grow a lot of muscle wood. You're probably all familiar with all our strains of muscle wood, the JN strain, ball of fire, fire spire. And the latest in that series is fire king. Fire King is a selection Michael Yanni here at Johnson's who now has his own company to introduce new plants. That is his latest introduction in the series. It's great fall color, makes a really good single stem tree and it replaces ball of fire, which was a nice wide plant, but didn't always color as well. Some colors extremely well. It's chip butted onto a rootstock and just fabulous color. When we're still on a testing stage at our Jackson location one fall, I don't know how many fields away I was from where it was growing, but I couldn't believe this row of flaming red plants that I just had to drive over to see what it was. And then I found out and it was our test variety that he had in the field, which eventually became named Fire King. Here's a shot of the foliage really good foliage when it's in perfect color. So if you're looking for a single stem Carpinus, give Fire King a try. I have a few municipalities who do dogwood, uh, Golden Glory dogwood. I have many who do not. Those who have always order again, but again, many do not. It's not really seen much as a street tree, but it's worked very well as a street tree for those who have tried it. Unlike other dogwoods, it's very resistant to foliar issues. Uh, we don't get septaria leaf spot and mildew and everything else. Uh, in fact, I know of no insect or disease problems on this plant. It again fits that niche for a small tree because it only grows about 18 feet tall by 15 wide. And from what I hear from the municipalities that have grown it, there's almost no pruning to do on it. They just love the plant. Here's a shot of the foliage of Golden Glory, really nice clean leaf all growing season. And it does fruit and flower. If there's a drawback to it, this is how they look the first year we dig them. It does suffer a little bit from transplant shock more so than some other plants. So that first season will have little tiny leaves, looks kind of weak. You almost have to wonder if it's going to make it. I don't believe we've ever lost any. If you let them get established a year later, they come around and look really well on the landscape. They do flower in normally for us end of April. It's a yellow flower and they do produce fruit. The fruit will be green, then it turns yellow later in the season, which you'll see on the left. It finally turns to red on the right. I should mention if anybody's wondering, they are not poisonous. Cornus moss is edible, although extremely tart. They actually grow a lot of them in Eastern Europe, especially around uh, Ukraine. They grow them just for the fruit. Although they now have selections out like Redstone and a few of the newer varieties, which do have sweeter fruit. But I wanna mention it because if you do use them on a street side planting, if children would pick the fruit, it's totally edible. The tree does well for us in Northern zone five. I don't know if I'd push it in the zone four. So if you're in zone four, I'm gonna say subject to trial or in a protected site, but here in Southeast Wisconsin, zone five, does really good for us. 
So something that's not used much that definitely needs to be used more in the landscape. Coffee trees. Yes, we still grow seeded and seedless. I know everybody wants seedless, but I gotta argue for seeded. They are just so beautiful. Those pods are just wonderful. When my youngest daughter was in third grade for show and tell, I brought in coffee tree pods for them and told the teacher, pass them around. My daughter read off what I had written for her and then I said, let the children open them up. You're gonna be surprised. Well, if you've ever seen coffee tree seeds, you know what I mean. Those kids cracked those pods open and their eyes about fell out, seeing those giant seeds. In fact, it started a riot. The teacher said the kids were fighting. Who could take the seeds home? I didn't bring very many pods in. <laughs> that wasn't my intention, but uh, hopefully they ended up going in the forestry or horticulture after that and I inspired them. But I know you all want seedless, so we do grow seedless. And we have numerous kinds. And I wanna mention that because in the beginning of this, I mentioned diversity within cultivars, between cultivars. It's not a monoculture yet, but I just wanna say there are other varieties of seedless coffee tree besides espresso. So let's utilize all of them. We need to be diverse. Let's not plant all the same coffee tree or all the same locust or all the same lilac on plantings. There's a home for all of these, let's use them. I've had people not buy seedless coffee trees I had this spring because I was out of espresso and they wouldn't try the other ones. So please give them a try. The first one I wanna discuss is decaf. This is relatively new for us. Brought out by a nursery in Wisconsin, not us, but a really nice tree. I'm very impressed with it. If you've ever bought coffee tree, you know how ugly they can look in youth. A small tree can have one or two branches and you have to wait a little four or five inch before they look good. Decaf on the other hand is very heavily branched at a young age for a coffee tree. So it tends to be, make it look much more dense, which is a good advantage to the tree. The leaves are also a little smaller, the leaflets, which also help make it look denser. Uh, here's another shot of decaf. You can see in summer with the new growth, it's almost drooping the foliage. Really neat form to it. Here's a shot of the leaf with the smaller leaflets. So again, that does make a difference on the appearance of the tree. We do grow espresso and not to say it's overused because there's not a lot of coffee trees around. So there's, they're definitely underutilized at the moment. Um, the biggest problem we have with espresso is keeping up with demand. Supply didn't catch up to demand yet. We've been increasing numbers. We have a container in B&B and we plant more and more every year. So hopefully we'll have enough. Still a nice tree, I can't fault it just keep the other ones in mind. Espresso for me tends to be a little lighter colored. I think when I look at the foliage always, it's more of a sea green color than some of the other cultivars that have a darker leaf. I've got pictures here showing espresso on our 25 gallon container on the left. A shot from one on the field on the right. So you can see that nice leaflet on espresso. We're also growing True North. True North is a selection made by University of Minnesota. It's an extremely large coarse leaf, which may sound like it's bad, but it's really nice. I really like this plant. I'm glad to see that we're growing it. Hopefully I can get people to buy it because it was so new last year, they didn't buy it. I want to show a shot of the difference in some of the leaves on these three varieties. To the right is True North with that larger leaflet and larger total leaf. So you can see that bigger coarse leaf. In the middle, the leaf, smaller leaflets is espresso, I'm sorry, decaf, 
and the one on the left is espresso. So there's quite a difference between them. I didn't show you and probably should have, but I don't have many. We're also growing a few prairie titan, which has a real almost bluish green leaf. It's one of my favorites. Regrettably, we can't get a lion or any more on it. So I don't know how much longer we'll be able to grow it. We still continue to hunt for any seedless coffee tree cultivar we can find and produce. So again, there's more diversity in coffee trees than ever before for seedless. We just need to know about them and use them. Early on when I was asked to give this lecture, I was told to talk a little bit about what can be used in place of ash, which fortunately for us is a lot. But my pet answer to that question is I stop or cork tree. It's definitely not used very much anywhere in the industry. It's actually kind of hard to get any cork tree. There's a reason behind that. This is the original picture of or a picture of the original eye stop record tree, which is in Long Necker Gardens, E.W. Madison's Arboretum. The tree was developed or selected by Dr. Ed Hasselkiss. We were given the chance to grow it, and actually we named it. Uh, Mr. Yanni, our former propagator, named it Eye Stopper due to that beautiful yellow fall color. As he always says, it's like butter yellow, and it stops in your tracks when you see it. So for years we grew it and propagated it and then suddenly there was an issue where we were not allowed to propagate it. We ended up buying liners from a West Coast grower and that's when we learned why most nurseries do not want to grow cork tree. Those bought in liners were horrible. We would plant 100, harvest 20 trees and burn 80 trees. We couldn't figure out what was wrong with these liners. So when they, some of people at Johnson's went out west and visited that grower. And he said, I hate cork trees. They don't work in our digging schedule. We put them in cold storage, they rot. They don't store in cool moist of the cold room. And we'd get the trees and the tops were dead and we're cutting them back, trying to make something out of them. It was an eye opener as to why you guys cannot find cork trees in most growers. We have since been allowed to re to do our own eye stopper cork trees in the house. We've got beautiful crops of them. So at least on our end, the problem is solved. Cork tree, like ash, will get about 45, 50 feet tall. Cork tree is zone three. We've had these growing up in Fargo that we shipped up there. They grow fast, great replacement for ash. They have a compound leaf. And I should mention they're dioecious, so there's male or female. You cannot, or hopefully cannot buy a female because the female is on the invasive list for the state of Wisconsin. And the female will produce about 10 million seeds a tree, little black seeds, and about 9 million will germinate under each tree each year. So you would know real quick if it's a female. But luckily this is a male clone. One thing on cork tree is it tends not to maintain a central leader. If you buy cork trees from us, you will notice that we work extremely hard to keep a central leader on an inch and a half through two inch tree. In fact, you'll see numerous printing cuts trying to keep that leader because it does not want to have a leader. I would say after two inch, I would let it go. That's the nature of the tree to live with it. You know, not all trees have a central leader. Well, on vacation in Minnesota this summer at a arboretum, of course, <laughs> I got to see plants when I'm on vacation. Here's some cork trees and I took pictures. These aren't eye stopper, but if you notice the canopy, there is no central leader. Very typical. So live with it. Here's another shot of it. They had a whole row of them along the roadway and that's just the way they grow. If you've never dug up a cork tree, they have a yellow root that is extremely aromatic. It smells just like ginger root. Many years ago, digging them up at a Barrett nursery I worked at, any broken root, and when we would put them in the cold room, it would smell like a Chinese restaurant for almost a month. 
extremely strong ginger smell, which is probably uh, something you didn't need to know, but it's interesting. <laughs> Wrong way here. Okay, another neat little tree, Amaramachia, Machia amarensis, again a zone three. Beautiful tree and it's got the most horrible name. I don't think you go to any dinner parties and your neighbor says, come on out and see my Amaramachia in the front yard. It's a tough sell for anybody, residential. And most municipalities don't even use it. I see more and more listing it on their lists, which I'm happy to see. Small, slow growing, maybe a little expensive because it is slower growing, but it just does extremely well where you need a small tree. Amaramachies are only gonna get about 30 feet. Just an interesting tree, I just really enjoy them. Most Amaramachias will have a very unique characteristic to the bark, which is shown left here, almost a blistering bark. Some do not. We've had some that are black barked, but most of them have this blistering look. As the tree ages, that'll disappear. As the bark gets older, it turns all black, and you'll see it only on the newer wood farther up the tree. To the right is the compound leaf of Amaramachia. Let's see, somewhat similar to coffee tree leaf, a little bit different. too far. Well, let's blame the guy that gave me the mouse. I never use a mouse, so hold on, I'll try to get back. There, we'll skip the mouse. I'll put it in the trap. <laughs> okay. Amaramachia and the new growth is really neat in the summertime because it has a real silvery look to that new growth. Currently we're doing uh, multiple cultivars of Amaramachia. We've had Starburst in the past. I think the common one now is Magnificent, which is more readily available. Um, we do plain species. I think there's one more. I think there's four right now we've got in production. Just see it on our lists, but it's something to consider because it's not well utilized, but it's very cold hardy and adaptable and great for when you need a smaller tree. Crab apples. I know they're not used a lot, but uh, there are some good ones out there. I always warn people, don't plant scab apples plant crab apples, there's a big difference. And one we try to promote is Emerald Spire. We've had it about five, six years. It was a selection made by Robert Ronald at Portage La Prairie, Manitoba for Jeffrey's Nursery. I've known him for many, many years. Emerald Spire is a columnar crab, 15, 18 tall, maybe eight wide, extremely short and extremely narrow. It's got kind of a bronze green leaf, light lavender flower, and it is the most, one of the most scab resistant crabs we grow. We have not found scab on it anywhere. Um, even in fields that are next to other crabs that next to them are just defoliated. This one has done extremely well. Back so well, we keep selling out, so we've actually started growing them in container. And this fall is our first crop of container growing emerald spire too. So we offer them B&B and container. But if you need something narrow and doesn't get scab, it's a good one to consider. And of course, coming from Manitoba, zone three, you won't have to worry about it for the cold. If there's any drawback to it, it does have fruits that are maybe a little bigger than most ornamental crabs. I'm gonna say they're probably half inch can live with that because the rest of the attributes make it so wonderful as a crab apple. Bald cypress, this is one I really enjoy. 
I'm so happy to see sales finally picking up on it. Don't see a lot of them around, whether they're yards or parks or municipalities, but definitely one we need to use more of. It's so adaptable. It can grow in water, it can grow in dry sites, it can grow if it's only wet in spring, doesn't matter. It seems to grow anywhere. I've had people say they can use it where nothing else grows because this clay is so heavy and low on oxygen. Well, this tree is adapted to low oxygen soils. And of course, the wood is highly prized because it's rot resistant. Dex, greenhouse benches, fence posts. Um, I once worked at a greenhouse that had decks from bald cypress. The holes, if you've ever seen bald cypress wood, you'll know what I mean. It looks like Swiss cheese. There's big holes in the wood. And it, those greenhouse benches were 80 years old and still going. Very good against weathering. There's a foliage of bald cypress, and of course it's uh, deciduous, but it's really soft foliage. Those needles will drop in color and fall. The cultivar we're growing is Shawnee Brave, although in the past we did do plain species. I have to say it leaves out extremely late in spring. It is the last plant to leaf out of anything we grow. You almost think it's dead not coming when it finally pops. This photo was taken early June, so be patient. They are very slow to leaf. Now here's a shot of one ball and burlap that we had in our yard that we saved. That's late June, so they really take off good in June, but you gotta be patient. Sweet gums, I know it's more of a Illinois, Michigan tree. Um, I'm going to say northern zone five is probably the borderline. I don't think I'd push it in the zone four. But we do have sweet gums in southern Wisconsin. There is a park near us that has some really big ones in the park. So we thought we would try them, and they've done fairly well. If we have a super cold winter, we can get a little tip dieback. They flush out of it. Hasn't been any major problem for us so far. I don't know how good it's going to work as a street tree, but as a parks planting or for commercial residential, it's something to consider. They are just beautiful in the fall and it's a little early, but I did take this this morning. The fall color is just starting to show up. You should get a really nice red fall color. So again, something for our area underutilized, consider using sweet gum. Lindens. Yes, there are some new lindens on the market and some that are on the market that aren't new but underutilized. Sweet Street Linden is our introduction. Tilia Americana Crom. Cultivar name is Crom because it's actually selected by Daryl Crom of Reeseville Ridge Nursery in Reeseville, Wisconsin. And the story from Daryl is he was traveling one day north of Watertown, Wisconsin on a country road. And here was this beautiful American linden that had a narrow form, but beautiful branch angles. So we stopped to look at it and decided to propagate it. We picked it up from him. We've been growing it for years and sold it as Crom Linden. Uh, some people with municipalities came out and looked at it and they tried it and it kind of caught on. And there's one of the trees, a big one at our Jackson Farm on display. It's a summer shot. Crom linden would take the place of American Century linden, which is a huge seller for American linden because of its jet beetle resistance. And while that's a great linden and we grow and sell lots of them, this one would feel is a lot better for two reasons. The branching habit is more horizontal. It doesn't have such narrow crotch angles like uh, American century linden. And the other reason is if you have century linden, it tends to look great till mid-August, late August, and it starts to streak on the leaves. And by mid-September, they're going dormant. Where crom linden or sweet street will have beautiful foliage all the way to October and the colors and drops. 
Cat beetle resistance we found has been about equally as good as American Century. Here's a shot of the same tree in the winter. So you can see those branch angles. They're a little upright, but not nearly the narrow angle of American Century. That's a leaf, nice clean leaf taken in August, showing the size and color of our linden. We actually stopped selling this for two years. We're trying to build the number up. I guess one of our issues is we're so good at developing plants and we need to be better marketing. And this is going nationwide, by the way. We have licensed other nurseries to grow it. Um, but we want to get our numbers up because in the past when we had new introductions, we would call for it and they'd sell it real quick. And people would say, every time I call, you never have it. So we want to build a number up. We are going to have this in real big numbers in probably two to three years at most. Um, we're doing several hundred a year now in the field. So when it does come out, do consider it. It's a great American linden. Sterling silver. This is an old linden. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. But what happened? We grew tons of them. We always had good sales. And I hate to say it, but maybe because it's a linden and lindens are having a negative rap because of Jack Beetle. I have to wonder if everyone has forgotten that sterling silver is the most resistant to Jack Beetle of all the lindens. This picture I took in August. And if you look at the lindens behind it, a different variety, you can see how brown they are, just decimated from Japanese beetle feeding damage to the leaf. And look at these lindens, uh, a few chewed leaves, very minor. So I, I don't understand what happened to sales on silver linden. So we have a bunch of them. I wish people would give them a home. They have a place. I just love the tree. It's so stocky for its caliper and height. It's got beautiful silver reverse to the leaf. It grows well. Um, it's great in zone five. I'm going to say maybe a little borderline for zone four. But please, let's keep sterling silver linden in mind. Um, an old plant that let's make it new again. I don't see a lot of them anywhere I go. Definitely underutilized in the urban landscape. Here's some shots again, a foliage shot on the left of sterling and a shot on the right of a linen sterling and 25 gallon. So we're offering a B and B or a container. And I do have a few shrubs. I know not all of you use shrubs, but some of you do commercial and residential landscapes. And I was asked to speak on shrubs or maybe boxwood. We'll do a few shrubs too. This is new on the market. It actually came out last August for us, this year for everybody else. It's Laisette Fragrant Sumac. It is a Russa Aromatica that was selected by Michael Yanni here at Johnson's, and brought out through his company. And of course, we're the first to have it because we started growing it right away. It is a seedling of Grolo sumac with a beautiful rounded form that gets three by three, so a little different shape over Grolo. Here's a shot of it in trial. We have Grolo to the left, we have Laisset to the right. So you, th you can see it's a very different form. To me in the picture, it almost looks like a giant boxwood, even though it would lose its foliage in the fall for fall and winter. To me, in the full sun areas, it would look almost like a boxwood in the distance. I think it's really neat. The advantage we find on this is not only the shape and leaf, it's the mite resistance. In the past, every few years, we've been plagued with a lot of mite damage to grow low. And here's a shot showing that. You might see it on your plants as well. And they set when they're growing right next to these plants in the field as a test. We have not found any mite damage anywhere on Laisette. 
So it seems to have resistance to damage from mite. I don't know if the mite don't like it or why, but uh, so far so good as far as mite resistance. This is a close-up of Lacette, so you can see that smaller leaf, really fine texture. And the fall color is just as good as grow low. And this is what we're selling currently. It's a two gallon that we've propagating grown here. They are available and they're available or will be available from other growers as well because we've licensed other growers to produce it. Bladder nuts, Stephelia, American bladder nut. This is one plant I really like. And we do grow and sell a lot of them. We offer ball and burlap in larger sizes. We offer it in two different containers. And yet I still have a lot of people who say, I'm not familiar with it, I've never heard of it, I don't use it. So again, if we're talking about underutilized plants in the urban landscape, this is definitely underutilized. Well, interesting that textbooks say bladder nut will get 12 to 15 feet tall. They like moist sites and slightly acidic. I'm so glad plants don't breed because we grow them in heavy clay soil in our open fields and they grow wonderful. We don't have any issues with them at all. They make a wonderful screening plant, as you can see in the picture here. They've got a lot of interesting characteristics, uh, 12 to 15 tall by eight wide. They grow sun or shade. Beautiful striated bark. They have a white bell-shaped flower that looks just like a flower on a blueberry plant, if you've ever grown blueberries. And they have a very unique seed pod. So they have four season interest. Primarily seed or cutting grown. And most American bladder nut doesn't have great fall color, but we're working on that. We are making selections for color. This is a shot of the flower of bladder nut. Again, that beautiful white bell-shaped flower in spring. To the right, you can see these seed pods in the summertime. They're still soft yet. To the left, it's a little later in the season. They're starting to color up. It ends up being almost a papery-like pod in the end. And here we are in late September, early October, starting to see a little color on the leaf and the pods actually turn white. They are just beautiful. When we get into late November, December, this was taken last year in November. If you recall last November, it felt like January, worst inventory month I ever had, <laughs> trudging through the snow. <laughs> But you can see how nice that shows up against the snow. But you can see that beautiful bark on American bladder nut and you can see the pods have now turned tan. And the interesting thing is they dry and all those seeds rattle. So when you go by them in the wind, you hear rattle, 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 rattle. It's just a unique plant. That's one of the seeds I pulled out of one of the pods to show you the, what the seed looks like. Now we are working on fall color to make a selection because not all of them do color well, but some have some promise. And to the left is the best colored one we can find so far, which I think is pretty good. Interesting thing is Mr. Yanni, who's developing this and running it through his company, uh, has brought this out to numerous growers and they say, it looks neat, but we're not interested. There's no market on it. Well, there sure is for us because we do sell and grow a lot of bladder nut. And I think there will be a better market if people utilize it more for what it's good for. If you want to hide something in someone's yard, if your person wants to screen out their ugly neighbor's house or their boat or whatever, air conditioning unit, this makes a wonderful screening plant.
we do have some new lilacs out. And again, I don't want to sound like an ad for Johnson's, but this was brought out by Johnson's and it's new. So I just want to mention it. Violet Uprising Lilac. This was selected in 2005 by Michael Yanni here at Johnson's for a batch of string of patula seedlings that he grew out. He selected it because this one has more of an upright form and great vigor and the flower was very nice. It'll get about six feet tall. He thinks about five wide. So far that's what it looks like it's going to do. And it starts out very narrow. So the thought was it would make a good hedging plant. And Unusual for a lilac, it has really good fall color. And lastly, I want to talk about the wimp factor scale for lilacs. If you've ever grown lilacs, especially French hybrids, you will know some lilacs are wimps. If we plant French hybrids in our field, which we do, we can have some, one variety that's four and five foot tall and next to it's a variety that's three feet tall planted at the same time, and they were the same size liner. So some lilacs are really bad wimps. They have little vigor. So Mr. Yanni was looking for something in his breeding that would have better vigor than what's out there. And he said this passes a test on his wimp factor scale. It has great vigor, it's not a wimp. This is the fall color. So for lilac, it's quite lovely. Lilacs usually don't have much fall color. So you may want to consider planting that one. It's got some good attributes and it's new on the market. So underutilized. And just a close up of the flowers to see how nice it is. It's really nice. Thank you. And that's all I've got for this session. I hope I've covered some plants that were new and old, but got you thinking about what you're not using or what you maybe used in the past and kind of forgot about. But let's remember, let's try to diversify between genus, between species. And if we can't, and every little bit helps, let's diversify between cultivars too. Thanks.